what we kind of going to do discuss uh, today it's a uh, today is a bonus lecture the last one right so as i promised you the rest of the course was um, pessimistic tragic and sad and today we'll try to switch uh, some of the elements the perspective from the tragic to comic one and basically we managed to uh, to see some of those uh, to do some of this through the lecture but not completely so the main um we mostly concentrated on the death scene trying to see death not as it conventionally uh sought as the opposite of life as someone that is um mm, someone that cancels uh death is something that cancels life is opposite to life but uh and worse than life to switch the perspective of um the centration on life which is which we have in our conventional uh world view like everything has to be life centered there is uh, what exists around that and our existence is enfoldment of life affirmation of life and we we try to see death as not the opposite of life, but it's constitutive to, uh, death is not opposite to life, but constitutive to life. Something that unfolds uh, within life, life as dying, and uh, not only the end of the life, and not maybe the end of the life, but the constitutive part, something that defines life, uh, something that happens during life, and something that uh, through which life or existence unfolds. Uh, so it is pessimistic perspective, and we did it mostly through the concept of through the concept of uh, being towards death uh, within existential perspective and the death drive. It's not only death, uh, which is kind of participates in this shift of of perspective but also everything negative which we try to avoid and by uh, avoiding by um, by allocating it as something secondary like uh, anxiety angst for Heidegger for Kierkegaard uh, with the emphasis of uh, all of them as inevitable or despair and uh, so basically their perspective is negative they try to see this negativity negative part of life as constitutive uh, which is tragic both concepts are tragic there's essential concept of being towards death heidegger's concept which sees life um as an uh, the moral um uh, ideal of being towards death that we need to embrace uh, the limit see uh we can say see the tragedy of this tragic aspect of our design of our human existence and the death drive psychoanalytic concept uh, which sabina spielrein and Freud and Lacan and all of the psychoanalytic thinkers develop, uh, especially late Freud, who put emphasis on from pleasure principle, which is associated with more reproduction and foldment of life, affirmation of life and enjoyment, uh, which shifted uh, his focus to the death drive, which is self-defeating mechanism. So human uh, started to be seen within late Freud uh, theory, not as a pleasure pursuing creature but more as a self-defeating mechanism self-sabotaging mechanism which is maybe broken and repeats its own traumatic existence so it's all uh, easier to define through the idea of a tragedy or um, and maybe there is some implicit call within it to embrace in heidegger for especially especially and to embrace the tragedy of existence, to um, to exist, to be this tragic hero, and the death drive. Uh, it's also there is this line of psychoanalytic thought that would call that we need to embrace because it's inevitable. It's considered we should stop running away from it and somehow embrace it as the as our fate. But there is also the other point of view that claim yeah the human existence from this perspective, this tragic perspective would be uh, like funerals of yourself, like your life, you're not only dead 
when your life and your existence ends, but also during life, you go through a series of losses, you losing yourself, um, you encounter the uh, rupture within your identity, you lose something uh, which you thought, uh, well, which you identify yourself with, including uh, parts of yourself, something you identify your, yourself with and what was part of your life. And uh, it's gone and you still something is still persists that you identify as yourself. So it's it can be seen from this tragic perspective is it's constant funerals, not only once, um, something you can't attend, but you actually, your life is uh, attending the end of your existence. And you you exist through the repetition uh, of this traumatic, traumatic loss um, and facing the nothingness of your existence, which is a tragic perspective. But uh, there is also a point of view um, that Simon Critchley, uh, one of uh, thinkers who claims um, this, that tragedy is not tragic enough, and we were discussing it a bit, because it's too heroic. And only in this way, comedy is truly tragic. So there is something in a tragedy when we say that this is a tragedy, um, or someone is a tragic hero. Uh, when we describe them that way, there is also there is this value in them that the kind of a triumph over the the very uh, tragic events that they went through, or uh, this tragic heroes that uh, existentialism, uh, like Heidegger, postulates. There is something that um, cancels the very tragedy of it, because if you say that someone's life is tragic, someone is tragic hero, then you kind of, uh, you give them a value precisely because uh, because of this strategy. And this is how the tragedy cancels itself. It's like, well done, saying for it. But there is never well done in a tragedy. There is never a reward um, of being moral or being authentic, like in Heidegger, in actual tragedy. So in this way, uh, comedy is more tragic because it doesn't give you a reward at the end. If you are comic and being a hero, tra tragic hero is a hero, right? You can't be comic hero uh it it's contradictory so you can't still being a tragic hero going through tra tragedy and recognizing that life is a tragedy this gives this reward and you are kind of a winner at the end there is something positive well in comedy it's uh it doesn't allow you to be tragic hero it doesn't allow you to win it's uh, more pathetic than the tragical uh tragical figure. And so we can discuss, we can come back a little bit to some of the uh, thinkers from this course and redefine the tragedy of existence um, of those concepts into a comedy of those concepts. Heidegger wouldn't be helpful that much uh, here. He doesn't talk uh, about humor and laughter and comedy that much or at all. Uh, from what I know. But he, he takes lots of his thinking from um, Kierkegaard and Kierkegaard, but not this part, not the comic part of Kierkegaard, uh, only the tragic and anxiety part. And Schopenhauer is of a much use here too. So let, if you'll come back to the context, context of the course and uh, try to elaborate those two concepts, two major concepts uh, from the tragic from the comic perspective instead of tragic perspective, it might also work better than what we did during the course, seeing it as a tragedy and putting emphasis on the tragedy, uh, redefine it as, as a comedy. Um, so Schopenhauer and we, uh, we were discussing him a little bit uh, with his ideas of comedy, even though he's the most, uh, most pessimistic philosopher He's also uh, have great insights about what humor is. And he is the one who pointed out among other thinkers uh, on incongruity, uh, non-coincidence or contradiction that is present in, uh, in humor. So according to him, we laugh 
uh, what makes us laugh is this this incongruity between the concept and the real object which have been sought through uh, in some relationship so there is uh, the theory of um, of human which is called uh, incongruity theory and schopenhauer belongs to uh, to the theorist who uh, define humor through contradiction or through incongruity as well as Kierkegaard. So uh, the different things that they would point different thinkers, uh, what is, where is this incongruity or contradiction lies, uh, but they all point that there is this non-coincident, there is some rupture in the, uh, in reality or in the speech that uh, makes us laugh, that gives this um, effect of laughter. And it's very important from a psycholytic point of view, the rupture, if you remember Glack and all of the non-coincidences that our reality and our self and the sociality is structured upon. And um, tragedy might capture this incongruity contradiction too, but also um, it gives it a positive value, like well done, we have, you have authentic uh, way of being now, or uh, something else positive and comedy captures it but doesn't give you maybe it does uh, in a way that we might enjoy laughter right but and not from uh, not from more existential point of view from existential or rational point of view it actually gives you nothing so the incongruity theory presupposes that you have certain expectation that something matches and then you uh, this expect expectations is not met. And because of this in coincidence, um, this affects in laughter. Of course, not every, not every violated expectation, uh, not every contradiction results in laughter. It might be also offensive. Uh, for example, some, someone is promising you, I don't know, something and you're not getting it. Especially if someone has a power over you, it's, you won't laugh, you will be upset or aggressive or, so it's not every violation of expectation is this, um, it's other, uh, it's other kind of, uh, of violation, specific um, in a way. We can say that it's supposed to be, there's supposed to be no, because humor can be offensive also, uh, except for, uh, affirming in a way the pathetic nature of our existence it can also uh, be offensive and uh, like secure the existing hierarchy someone uh, laughing at someone else that's not if you don't include yourself um, if you don't include yourself in what you laugh at it won't work you kind of have to this kind of humor has to start and include yourself so it, it has, has to start with you and you can laugh uh, at others too, but only if you, in my view, only if you include yourself in it, if you are an instance of this uh, recognition of how pathetic you are, then it works, then it's not offensive, because if we claim that humor, because of this discrepancy, because of the uh, incongruity and contradiction, if it actually captures uh, this lack or contradiction within our existence, within our self, within in the society, it actually captures the most uh, genuine thing, right? In the same way as a tragedy, but it doesn't give you anything back. And that's very vulnerable position. And if this vulnerable position is used to, um, to uh, like attain a power over something, uh, someone, la you're laughing on someone because they don't meet expectation because they're pathetic. It's the, uh, you violate, you expose their um, their vulnerability and you use it in the wrong way. So if it doesn't start with you, if you're not the instance of uh, laughter, uh, which later uh, can include other people or other parts of reality, then it won't work. Um, then it's not, there is no tragedy actually there. It's just offensive. Um, and no comedy too, in this way at least. So Schopenhauer also claims that that's the example of, um, of incongruity, of contradiction, how it works. For example, uh, 
this Austrian joke that someone likes to walk alone and they meet a person and they also like to meet, uh, to walk alone. Uh, so they decide to walk together. We can say to simplify it, if someone likes to be alone and they meet the other person that also likes to be alone, then they can be alone together, which is funny because it violates the very definition of what is being alone and it violates the, uh, the definition of togetherness. But uh, paradoxically, that's, this joke captures the best how human relationship works, especially today, uh, how healthy relationships are defined with those boundaries that you're supposed to have. It's actually what is demanded from you is to be alone or the other thing is that uh, if you can, uh, you're not ready for a healthy relationship if you can't be alone, something like that. So it's actually the definition, the paradoxical definition of human relationship. You're supposed to be both in relationship and by yourself, which is funny, which captures by this through this paradox, the actual, that wasn't, wasn't Schopenhauer uh, thing to discuss it. It's more from a psychological point of view, but that's just the example that uh, Schopenhauer provides, but it just captures something, the most the profound contradiction of human relationship when we are alone, that is demanded to be alone and together at the same time. And this is pathetic and impossible, right? To realize. Um, you remember this passage where uh, Schopenhauer claims that as the most, uh, the most pessimistic philosopher who is known uh, to be a pessimist, except for claiming that our existence is a tragedy. Uh, but if you see it in detail, it can also it also has the character of a comedy, uh, precisely because there, there are contradictions in those lives, the expectations that are not met and that will never be met, like how the will works. It wants something, but it's, it can never be satisfied, but you still want it like something self-defeating that may be earlier prototype of, uh, of uh, Freud's um, being towards death. We, uh, we exist by self-defeating ourselves. We want something, but we can never get it. We can never satisfy the will. So it's the paradoxical nature of our existence, the self-defeating mechanism, which is actually uh, uh, funny. It can also be put the other way around, in my view, right? That it's um, it's in detail when we see it, uh, discuss it in detail, what our life is, it's tragic. But uh, we can say that on the contrary, when you see it as a whole, it's the comedy. Like when you go beyond the details, it's more like, like a comedy. You can say it both ways, it can be. Um, it can be approached both as a comedy and a tragedy. Um, so that's Schopenhauer. And yeah, the comedy of being towards death and the comedy of, uh, of a death drive. It actually helps us. So uh, let's maybe try to use some of Schopenhauer's ideas and some of Kierkegaard's ideas on humor to approach those two concepts at the end as. Um, something that belongs to a realm of comedy instead of a realm of, uh, of a tragedy. And the other philosopher who is also, especially work uh, that you were reading, Sickness into Death, uh, Kierkegaard discusses the, uh, in his existential stages, which you first start with a aesthetic stage, which is a stage of the unhappiest one, you progress to ethical stage and then you progress to religious stage. And if you remember Kierkegaard's, um, Kierkegaard's uh, progress, it's actually self-annihilating progress, right? It's negative, uh, it's self-destructive. You basically uh, distance yourself from yourself and the whole of the Kierkegaard's ethics, which is Christian ethics, is this presupposes self-annihilation, um, kind of a suicide extended into life, which is tragic. But at the same time, there is the, uh, between those stages, there is the continuum of irony and there is continuum or continua of uh, humor. So um, it's also progress 
through irony and it's also progress to um, to humor humor and irony humor uh, is defined by Kierkegaard as more there's a higher uh, type of um, of irony so continuum is something that um, relates something paradoxical that relates to two stages and um, defines both of them so if you remember we were discussing irony uh, and irony is for Kierkegaard. First of all, his life is tragic and comic at the same time. It's like the best example with his engagement, uh, which he renounces and uh, suffers after it, and uh, him being ridiculed and he ridiculing himself. Uh, also in his works where he elaborates um, very difficult uh, thoughts, but also every time he, he would take it away, he would do something and a hint uh, at that uh, his thoughts shouldn't be perceived seriously. So whatever he would take, uh, elaborate, he would also take it away. And this is the negative move. So uh, his all his all philosophy is ironic, and his thinking is ironic. And what he called irony is um, infinite negativity. It coincides with the formation of self, the formation of individuality, which is Socratic method, ironic method. So you negate every thought that you have. Socratic method, when Socrates, Socrates talks to other people and um, might agree with them, but then disagree with them and take, take away any result almost uh, that, they, uh, that they come to through their thinking, right? So it's the negation and this uh, irony as a form of thinking which is constitutive to subjectivity, it's negative self annihilating move. When any, think, any thought that you have, you doubt it, you take a distance, critical distance from it, and you criticize it, you take it away. That's the irony. Um, irony is negative move, uh, negative process, self annihilating process. And through this self annihilation, subjectivity is actually emerges, right? But there is other stage if irony, the first uh, continua is irony and the next one is humor. So we can say that uh, humor, uh, Kierkegaard defines it as the last stage of existential awareness uh, before faith. Uh, it's, we can say that it's affirmative more because uh, irony is negative act. This one it might be defined uh, he's defining more as an affirmative one, um, as both and uh, affirming some contradictions and paradoxes. But what is affirmed is uh, paradoxically nothingness, right? So it, if it, even if it's affirmation, it's affirmation of, uh, of nothingness, of a paradox, uh, something, existence of something that cannot be, that cannot exist. And also Kierkegaard, the only, thinker in this course that is a religious thinker. Uh, it's also, even though the end stage for him, religious is a religious stage, the leap of faith, what is called um, the dissolvement, paradoxical dissolvement into uh, God, but it's also self-annihilative, right? You dissolve yourself to the end, it's like a suicide if you, uh, if you read it um, in a atheist way. But he also claimed that Christianity is um, humorous. There is a humor in there. And that's if you, there is a comedy in all the, um, in all the thinking, the serious stages that he suggests. And it's very hard to, uh, to locate it in work that you were reading, but it, it's there. It's just a different light, uh, different, point of view, a different perspective, framework that you can find in Kierkegaard instead of the serious uh, self-annihilative um, tragic perspective that he uses. Uh, but you can also find this other age, the other dimension, which is uh, humorous and uh, comical dimension as, as his life is. It's both and tragic and comic. And this is what he was actually writing about. Um, the tragic and comic are the same, and so far as both are based on contradiction. So in similar way, uh, like 
uh, Schopenhauer, he, uh, he emphasizes the necessity of the contradiction, the existing, basically he is the uh, thinker of contradiction of dialectics and uh, absurdity even. And that's the both dimension, the tragic dimension and uh, comic dimension, they do, they're based on contradiction. There's something that requires contradiction and um, absurdity uh, in a way. He also distinguishes them, but uh, in this point, they do coincide. So Critchley would say, uh, that um, it's better, comic uh, acknowledgement is better than heroic authenticity uh, because heroic has authenticity. It still presupposes self, uh, authentic self, a certain tragic authenticity where comic, uh, comical is something that uh, takes away the authenticity, like you recognize yourself or you uh, self annihilate yourself, uh, renouncing authenticity, which might be useful for uh, rethinking psychoanalytically, psychoanalytically the concept of a death drive. And also, Alianka Zupancic uh, talks in her book and her father's uh, work uh, about comedy. And she claims that's very interesting. So that uh, comedy gives voice to a body, uh, voice and a body to the impasses and contradictions of this uh, materiality itself. So she's like a psychoanalytic thinker. And for her, uh, reality and uh, human self is uh, presupposes Lacanian thinker. So it's all based on uh, constituted through ra uh, through lack and ruptures. Uh, they are included in the reality, and they uh, they constitute the reality, right? And comedy or comic uh, is and can be can be seen as embodiment of, of this rupture. So to explain this further, she claims that um, in tragedy, subject states the universal, the tragic narrative narrates about the universal principle, about this non-coincidence, um, the negative self annihilative um, structure of reality. Uh, of uh, human existence and uh, whatever. But in comedy, the subject becomes universal. You are actually an instance when you say a joke and when you laugh, you are at the instance of this, um, of this non-coincidence. You're not only a narrator, you're not only someone who is outside of it, but you are actually in the instance of the rupture of reality uh, in coincidence with the reality uh, of itself. And it's very, it's also possible to, um, to connect the uh, notion of a death drive. She, she talks here about the drive, psycholytic drive as such, but we can say specifically about death drive, which is a prototype in psychoanalysis of a drive as such. So we can equate through this idea, the death drive as something comic. Uh, the death drive as a compulsion, as a repetition, pure repetition, uh, a repetition of luck. We can say that it's um, when we laughed, this is what we reproduce, what we manifest, the instance of, uh, we become the instance of repetition compulsion. And uh, when we think about laughter, it's the, the way Critchley, Simon Critchley uh, writes about it is that it's uh, involuntary compulsions of your body, right? And this is the physical, can be seen as physical embodiment of, uh, um, of the tragical uh, nature or of a tragical incidence in, in reality, but also as embodiment of the death drive, which is a pure, pure repetition. And it doesn't have any, um, it's paradoxical, it unfolds, um, doesn't have any uh, meaning, it doesn't lead anywhere. Uh, it doesn't explain anything, right? A joke. A joke only violates the expectation. A joke only 
based on contradiction and then we laugh, we reproduce the, the laughter, the involuntary compulsion, uh, which is not laughter is in this way, in a similar way as death drive, as death drive and drive as such, it's wasteful, right? Just for nothing. You don't explain, can't explain anything with a joke. Joke is not for explanation. Joke is not coherent. It's not, um, it doesn't bring any new knowledge or create new knowledge. It just exists. Um, yeah. So this, this lack, the rupture between S and S, it can be old self uh, and new self. Uh, we were discussing it as something that creates the lack, the rupture that creates uh, creates both the structural to both the non coincidence that it's uh, part of uh, unfoldment of the history of self, the non coincidence with itself, but also the rupture be between subject and a subject that creates, disconnects, and connects them at the same time. So psychoanalysis is. Um, art of thinking that includes this lack and the rupture as constitutive, or we can say death negation as something that is constitutive to the uh, to reality of self and of, of uh, social bond. And comic, comical, comic dimension is actually something that tragedy captures it. Uh, because in tragedy, you are, uh, you are a loser, it doesn't end well, and it's still this uh, destructive destructiveness, bad ending, it still unfolds into some story. According to Simon Critchley, it's still, um, it's still a positive formation because it gives you a reward, but uh, we can say that in comedy, it still accounts for the, uh, for the luck, it still represents it as a luck, but it, you don't have um, anything in return, you're not recognized as a hero. You're not recognized as you have now authentic form of life as with uh, Heidegger and his being towards death. Uh, you are, you're not recognized at all. The best you can get with a joke uh, is not to be prized as someone, um, but you can uh, make others laugh. So this, uh, this, the way Critchley writes about it, this um, convulsive uh, mom, invol involuntary movement is contagious and we can just participate in this in this together. That's the best uh, recognition you can get. It's not actually recognition of you as a hero, but it's actually on a level of sharing the involuntary compulsion of laughter. That's all. You kind of disappear. It's annihilative. Uh, act of annihilation of uh, self, unlike in a tragedy which presupposes the triumph of, of self and triumph over uh, over death, right? Because you conquer a death in a way, you become a tragic hero, you get the title of a hero, um, which in comedy is excluded. It just accounts for the luck, um, but doesn't give you nothing in return. It is itself, um, the manifestation of, of luck. 